Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Maria Heiler, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Washington, D.C. Office and a Senior Researcher for the Learning Policy Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization committed to advancing evidence-based policies that support equitable and empowering learning for each and every child. Welcome to our virtual briefing, State and Federal Opportunities to Support More Diverse and Inclusive School Systems. I'd like to let the audience know that this webinar is being recorded. A video recording will be emailed to you in a few days and the slides are currently available as a link in the chat box. I'd like to recognize and thank the event co-sponsor, the National Coalition on School Diversity and the offices of Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut and Representative Marsha Fudge from the 11th District in Ohio, who we'll hear from shortly. We're gonna begin with some framing remarks from LPI's president and CEO, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, and uh, thanks as well to Jessica Kardashian and the entire LPI team that has organized this briefing. It does take a village, as well as to Senator Murphy and Congresswoman Fudge, um, whose work we will be discussing today, and my good friends, Gloria Letts and Billings and Carlos Cortez and Eric Gordon, who are brilliant leaders in this field and will be speaking later. As you all know, uh, today we are experiencing three crises, uh, a public health crisis, an economic crisis, and a civil rights crisis that has been long in the making and is a recurrent feature of the American landscape. All of these crises are manifesting in ways that illustrate the effects of systemic racism and inequality in this country. They also illuminate the great divide that characterizes America by race and class and by neighborhood. Communities of color and low-income communities are hardest hit by both the health effects and the economic effects of this pandemic. Our longstanding inequalities have grown and now create a chasm between the haves and the have-nots. Consider the experience of different children um, at this moment in different communities. In some places uh, where there is plenty of advantage, uh, kids and districts were all wired up with one-to-one -one laptops and high-speed internet when the uh, schools were closed. Um, they have been at home and maybe squabbling over who gets you know, access to which part of the house for their online learning, uh, but basically um, in a safe space with all of the tools that they need, both as a family and as children, uh, to be able to both learn and engage in society in this moment. And in other communities uh, where there have been uh, the remnants of the digital divide, which still continue in many parts of the country, where many, many children had uh, no bandwidth, no high-speed internet, no digital devices, uh, where the health effects have meant that many families have experienced loss, have experienced illness, where um, jobs have been lost, where health uh, care insecurity, uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity mean that children may be uh, finding that they don't have places to live, much less to study, um, where um, homelessness is growing, uh, where schools are the source of food and where people are going to drop off spots to pick up their meals for the day and perhaps the evening and even the weekend. Um, the experience has been uh, dramatically more traumatic uh, and uh, uh, predictive of a growing chasm in educational opportunity. Uh, these challenges then are exacerbated uh, by the fact that inequitable school funding formulas often privilege the more privileged in at least 30 states um, where there is overall nationally uh, a difference of about $1,800 per pupil in spending for those districts serving predominantly white students and those serving mostly students of color. These uh, under-resourced schools that serve the highest need students also typically have inadequate resources, um, a revolving door of inexperienced teachers, uh, the um, inability to offer a full rich curriculum, uh, crumbling facilities, uh, especially in the growing number of apartheid schools with concentrated poverty. 
And segregation and unequal funding have tended to go hand in hand for decades. Something that was understood by Thurgood Marshall and others uh, who brought the board, Brown versus Board of Education litigation. In fact, the suits leading up to that uh, final decision uh, variously argued about the inequality and in funding of schools serving different groups of students and the segregation that accompanied those inequalities. And then we have seen that they were right, that when districts and states and the federal government make significant investments in creating more diverse schools and inclusive learning experiences, a significant gains can be made. In the 1960s and 70s, we saw rapid progress made on desegregation and school funding reforms. The federal government invested in schools at a much higher rate, um, created many of the equity-oriented federal programs we have today, and provided funding to districts to reduce segregation through transportation supports, magnet schools, and other vehicles. And during that period of time, the Black-White achievement gap declined by more than half in reading and by more than a third in math. And had we stayed on that trajectory, the achievement gap would have been closed by the year 2000. Um, those uh, effects uh, were captured in a book by R Rucker Johnson recently, a major nationwide study entitled Children of the Dream, in which he found that black students who were able to be exposed to court order desegregation for uh, as at least five years, experienced significant gains in achievement and graduation rates, uh, an increase in their wages, and a big decline in annual poverty rates. Uh, despite those gains, however, we retreated from these investments in the 1980s. Uh, as a result, Black students are half as likely to be in majority white schools today as they were 30 years ago. The same kind of segregation has occurred for Latinx students, uh, and more of these schools are under-resourced. Today, the achievement gap is 30% larger than it was 30 years ago. Uh, as we'll hear more about our discussion today, the research on the benefits of integrated and culturally responsive education for students is well documented. These benefits include not only stronger academic achievement, but also uh, greater cross-cultural understanding, reduced bias and prejudice, stronger civic participation in a diverse global economy, among others. So now is the time to recommit ourselves as a nation to advancing anti-racist policies that lead to a more just and inclusive nation. Every era of equity progress has come on the heels of great social upheaval. When people of conscience join together to confront injustice and inequality. These have come most powerfully in 30 year cycles. The 1870s ushered in reconstruction, the 1900s, uh, early uh, progressive changes for workers and schools. The 1930s brought FDR's New Deal on the heels of the crash and the Great Depression. The 1960s ushered in the Great Society and the War on Poverty, even as we were um, protesting in civil rights and against the Vietnam War. The early 1990s strengthened economic and educational equity. So that 30 year cycle brings us to 2020 and that moment is now with us again. Our nation's schools play a critical role in creating a more racially just and inclusive democracy. And we hope that our conversation today will surface specific policy actions that can be taken at the local, the state and the federal level to move us forward as a nation. And now it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Senator Chris Murphy from the great state of Connecticut. Senator Murphy, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. He is a member of the Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, the Appropriations Committee as well, and an eloquent and untiring voice, for justice and equality in education. Senator Murphy consistently puts forward research-based policy ideas for supporting state and local efforts to ensure that all students have access to the resources and the supports they need to fully participate in a democratic and global society. And in Senator Murphy's home state of Connecticut, the Supreme Court ruled that the racial, ethnic, and economic isolation in the city of Hartford violated the state's constitutional obligation to provide all children with racially integrated and equal educational opportunities. And in response to that decision, the state and district took a number of measures that led to greater diversity, including an inter-district desegregation effort that proved highly successful 
It's documented in an LPI report called Sharing the Wealth and recognizing that there's a federal role in supporting states and districts in this effort, Senator Murphy, along with Congresswoman Fudge, introduced the Strength and Diversity Act, which provides federal funds to support state and local efforts to create greater racial and socioeconomic diversity in our nation's public schools. That work is the topic of today's event. <laughs> Senator Murphy, thank you so very much for joining this conversation. Uh, great, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, uh, uh, Linda, great to see you. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, both to LPI uh, and, and to uh, NCSD. Uh, I apologize, I'm gonna be very brief because we have a pending vote on the Senate floor. Uh, we've got about two minutes left to make it, um, but I did wanna be able to uh, jump on and encourage you in this conversation. Uh, as uh, Linda mentioned, uh, for the last several years, I've been the proud co-sponsor uh, along with Representative Fudge of legislation that would uh, authorize significant federal funding for voluntary school integration efforts, uh, racial and economic integration efforts. And uh, we hope that in the next Congress, we can convince our colleagues in the new administration to take up this initiative. But we uh, have understood from the beginning that what we are offering is a relative drop in the bucket uh, and that ultimately uh, this is going to have to be a fairly massive um, a combined state, local, and federal effort to reverse a really disturbing trend line. I, I picked just up the last few minutes of your remarks, uh, Linda, but you may have you know, talked about the fact that while we're proud of CHEF in Connecticut and while we have made progress specifically through the build out of our magnet school system, uh, the number of intensely segregated uh, minority schools uh, has doubled in the state of Connecticut uh, since 1988. Uh, and while that sounds pretty bad, uh, the number of intensely segregated schools nationally during that period of time uh, has tripled. Uh, and so we are heading in the wrong direction rather than the right direction at the same moment when we have just reams of data to tell us that uh, kids are better off if they are uh, in environments where they um, get to know kids of different economic and racial backgrounds. And we have this sort of second uh, civil rights movement that is building all across this country, um, we need to understand that if we aren't able to build empathy and understanding, if we are only uh, able to teach white kids about what it's like to be black through instruction and teach black kids about what life is like in other neighborhoods, uh, then we're losing. Um, it, it, if you want to understand what it feels like uh, to have police targeting you, um, then you need to have a black friend growing up, right? You need to go to school with students of color. Uh, a, a civil rights reckoning in this country demands a revolution of empathy. And that revolution of empathy can only happen if we desegregate uh, our schools and our communities. So voluntary funding can help, um, but in the end, uh, this has to be a massive effort in which we are changing our zoning laws, we are changing our housing laws, we are eliminating uh, these school financing gaps that, again, in a state like mine, are getting worse, not better. Uh, and while this can happen through legislation, uh, and I know you're going to talk about the ways in which we can push federal and state legislation to encourage more inclusive learning environments, um, uh, we also need to recognize that there's just a fundamental imbalance of political power right now uh, and that we can have conversations all we want about what legislation is most important. But if we don't also do the hard political work of empowering communities of color, empowering students to speak for themselves, then none of this is possible. We've got a laundry list in Connecticut of bills that will create more integrated learning environments. But almost none of them can pass, um, not because people in the state legislature don't know they're the right thing to do, but because there is no political power to get it done. All of the power in Connecticut rests in the white suburbs. Um, very little of it rests in communities that care about civil rights, that care about this uh, integration diversity agenda. Uh, and so um, that's my, my pitch is uh, to, to, to work with those of us like myself and Representative Fudge who want to deliver federal solutions, 
um, but to also not be afraid of getting into the political work here. I know it's not a topic for this call, um, but ultimately the only way to pass these measures is to uh, provide that political power uh, behind communities and behind agendas that right now uh, significantly lack it, and I see that on a, in a very real way on the ground in my state of Connecticut. So uh, I'm going to run down uh, and, uh, and vote, but uh, thank you so much uh, for, for convening this conversation on increasing diversity, inclusivity in schools to, to LPI and, 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 and CSD. Um, thanks for being such great partners to, to me and, and, uh, and to my office. And of course, as you know, I sort of steal all of this advocacy from my wife, Kathy, uh, who works uh, in and around this field and with many of you. So I uh, should never fail to give her credit. If I sound like I, I know 5% of what you all know on this, it's because of her. So have a, a great event. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being with us. And I'm going to hand it back to Maria Heiler, our moderator. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for your framing comments. And um, we are so appreciative for Senator Mur Murphy and his time and the efforts, um, and especially around introducing the Strength and Diversity Act. I would like to now welcome E. Yang Garrison from the Office of Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, who represents the 11th Congressional District of Ohio. Congress, Congresswoman Fudge is a member of the House Education and Labor Committee and the Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Human Services. Congresswoman Fudge is a longstanding advocate for providing every child with equitable access to a quality education from preschool through post-secondary education programs and for protecting civil and human rights. Please join me in welcoming E. Yang Garrison, who serves as Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislator Director for Representative Fudge to provide some remarks on behalf of the Congresswoman. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I wanted to thank you, the Learning Policy Institute, uh, the National Coalition on School Diversity for hosting today's webinar. And I would be remiss if I didn't give a special thanks and shout out to Cleveland Metropolitan School District Superintendent Eric Gordon for participating in today's webinar. Uh, Congresswoman Fudge, Thanks you all for the work that you do to address the issue of school diversity in her home, in her home district uh, and, and throughout the country. Uh, uh, Congresswoman Fudd, she, she typically begins any remarks on this issue by making the, the point that racial segregation in public education has been illegal for more than 66 years in the United States, but still American public schools are more segregated today than any time since the 1960s. Um, in addition to the research uh, that Ms. Darling Hammond articulated, uh, research also tells us that school desegregation leads to cross-racial friendships and a decline in stereotyping, allowing students to better navigate an increasingly diverse society and preparing them for real-world experiences. Uh, Congresswoman Fudge has worked on school diversity legislation since 2016. Uh, the Strength and Diversity Act, as Senator Murphy said in his remarks, it directly addresses inequities in public education by authorizing funding to support local education leaders in their efforts to lessen racial and socioeconomic isolation in public schools. The bill provides support for school districts that are developing or expanding or implementing school diversity initiatives. Now, one point that I think we haven't made just yet, and I'm, I'm sure this was something that, that may be discussed later on in the webinar, is that this is practically the same policy as the Obama administration sought to pursue in 2016 with its Opening Doors Expanding Opportunities Program. That program provided $12 million to help school districts increase school diversity. Nearly 30 school districts from 22 states in the District of Columbia applied for the Obama era grant, but the program was eliminated by the current administration in 2017. Like Senator Murphy said in his remarks, which I thought were, were great, uh, our nation is experiencing a racial reckoning. And Congresswoman Fudge is hopeful that Congress will push the House passed Strength and Diversity Act either this year or next Congress, across the finish line so that we can start to put an end to racial isolation and segregation in our nation's schools. The importance of this issue cannot be overstated. 
So again, Congresswoman Fudge, she thanks you all for hosting this webinar. She thanks you all for your leadership on issues of school diversity. And she looks forward to continuing to work with you all uh, on this very important issue. So my remarks are, are brief. Uh, but again, like the Congresswoman is so happy that you guys are hosting this webinar. So thank you again for inviting me. Uh, and I look forward to, to hearing everyone's remarks. Thank you so much, Yi Yang, for your office's leadership on these issues. Um, we appreciate your time and um, sharing those um, thoughts and remarks. I'd like now to introduce Janelle George, Senior Policy Advisor for LPI to share the research on one evidence-based approach to increasing school diversity and improving outcomes for students. Janelle. Thanks so much, Maria. Uh, for this introduction. Uh, today I'm going to share research from an upcoming LPI report on the common components of magnet schools that are effective at creating greater diversity and successful outcomes for students and the policy implications of that research. Magnet schools are public schools that emerged in the 1960s as remedies in school desegregation cases, particularly following the Brown versus Board of Education ruling as court sought ways to support districts in fulfilling Brown's promise of expanding access to quality integrated education opportunities. While magnets vary widely in design and structure, a magnet school can be defined as a public elementary or secondary school or an elementary or secondary education center that offers a special curriculum capable of attracting substantial numbers of students of different racial backgrounds. Some magnet schools focus on specific themes like the arts or science, and some focus on various educational approaches, such as Montessori or international baccalaureate programs. They're designed to foster racial and socioeconomic diversity. Despite their intent, not all magnet schools are achieving these goals. In our upcoming report, we examine the research on magnet schools and identify five key components of magnet schools that increase diversity and provide high quality learning opportunities. These include, First, the magnet school is structured as what's called a whole school magnet school, where all students enrolled participate and the magnet school theme is embedded throughout the school. This is compared to an in-school magnet program, where only a portion of students in the school are enrolled, and this, which can have an exclusive or tracking effect, even when housed in an otherwise diverse school. Second, the magnet school incorporates integration into school design, structure, mission, and goals, such as implementing targeted enrollment practices within and across districts through interdistrict programs. Third, the, the school conducts outreach to diverse families to inform them about the magnet school and support their application to the school. Fourth, the school implements inclusive admissions or enrollment practices, such as lotteries or open enrollment. And finally, the district or school provides free transportation. So states and districts can support these efforts in a few key ways. First, targeted funding, including for family outreach, uh, including throughout the admissions process, uh, funding for the equitable provision of transportation uh, for students in particular who are drawn from surrounding districts, uh, to aid in the recruitment, hiring, and development of teachers to support teaching in diverse magnet schools. This includes providing ongoing professional development for magnet educators, including on culturally responsive learning and the non-discriminatory administration of school discipline. And in addition to funding support, states can allow interdistrict transfer programs. Uh, this was previously mentioned that ensure that school students from surrounding districts can attend the magnet school. This is particularly important because research shows that segregation often occurs between districts due to housing segregation. 
In addition, states can establish public school choice zones and revise school boundaries. And there are also a number of ways the federal government can support these efforts. First, it's important to honor and visibly uphold the historic federal role in supporting state and district diversity efforts, signaling to states and districts that the federal government is poised to offer support is vital to these state and local desegregation efforts. And federal support through grant funding to schools and districts that are operating independently or in collaboration with neighboring districts, as well as to regional educational authorities and education service agencies is also vital. This policy and others are included in the Strength and Diversity Act, which has been discussed. Congress can also significantly increase funding for the Magnet Schools Assistance Program. In fiscal year 2020, just 107 million was provided for the program, compared with 440 million directed to charter schools, which have been found to be more segregated than other choice options. Congress and the Department of Education can also work together to ensure that the Magnet Schools Assistance Program prioritizes applicants and incorporate the components described earlier, such as inclusive enrollment practices and the centering of diversity in school design, structure, and goals. And finally, as it did following passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the federal government can offer technical assistance and guidance to aid states in implementing evidence-based components to foster diverse and effective magnet schools. Thank you, Maria, and everyone, please stay tuned for the report's official release. Thank you so much, Janelle. We really appreciate that evidence-based um, example, um, how to support a diverse and inclusive um, <clears throat> education system and um, appreciate um, the policy recommendations that you gave at the state, federal, um, and local levels. So we're going to expand this conversation a bit and um, we're going to go ahead and introduce um, our esteemed panelists, their full bind, their full bios can be found in the chat, um, but very briefly, Dr. Gloria Latson billings is the former Kellner Family Distinguished Professor of Urban Education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and faculty affiliate in the Department of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Carlos Cortez is Edward A. Dixon Emeritus Professor of History at the University of California, Riverside. He serves on the faculties of the Harvard Institutes for Higher Education, the Summer Institute for the Intercultural Communication in Portland, Oregon, and the Federal Executive Institute. Eric Gordon is the Chief Executive Officer of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and is responsible for the leadership and daily management of Cleveland's 39,000 student school system. As a reminder, please submit questions for panelists using the Q&A button below. So let's turn to our panelists. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to this conversation and want to jump right in with the first question um, for Gloria. I so enjoyed reading um, Dream Keepers and the research that you've done on culturally relevant teaching. Um, could you please describe the pillars of culturally relevant teaching for um, folks, what they are and why they're important for all teachers to practice? So thank you, Maria. Uh, my work is indeed about what happens in the classroom. So the, the pillars that define um, culturally relevant pedagogy are important, but I want to make sure that we don't gloss over some of the misconceptions that this is somehow a pedagogy for Black or Latinx students. Indeed, it is a pedagogy that's comprised of the three components to improve the learning experience for all students. And those three components are, include academic achievement or student learning, where teachers are indeed responsible for the academic growth of students. And it's important, uh, we believe, for teachers to know where our students begin when they arrive in their classrooms and to be able to document their progress throughout the year so that they have an accurate assessment of that progress. Because of that, we are also suggesting and, and really arguing that formative ass assessment is as important 
as the summative assessment that we are looking along the way is how students are doing because that formative assessment gives teachers indicators for what they can do and what kinds of moves they can make pedagogically what kind of adjustments they can make the second pillar is cultural competence and this dual function of cultural competence is to both encourage students understanding and the appreciation of their own culture of origin as well as their cultural practices uh, in which they participate but it's also designed to help students develop facility in at least one other culture beyond their culture of origin so that suggests that even white mainstream students need to develop cultural competence so they'll be prepared to operate successfully in an increasingly diverse nation and a globally interconnected world and then finally we have this notion of the socio-political or critical consciousness and this third component focuses on the democratizing function of education it prepares our students to critically examine both what they are learning in the classroom as well as what they are experiencing in the community and the wider world beyond the classroom. Thank you so much for um, that brief introduction um, to the pillars. And I, I think um, the point that you make about it being for all students is so critical. I think people hear culturally relevant pedagogy and they think, oh, that's for those kids over there. Right. But from listening to the pillars, it's obvious that um, it's for all students in all classrooms. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I actually actually want to turn, I think, really related to this um, is ethnic studies. Um, and um, we think about the connection there. And Carlos, we know that research has found that access to ethnic studies courses can not only increase students' knowledge, but also propel stronger achievement and attainment for students. What do you think about that? And how do you think those courses should be designed and incorporated into school curriculum? Thank you, Maria. Yes, uh, we know that ethnic studies can increase student achievement in things other than ethnic studies itself. Uh, the question is why? And I think because of the concept of centrality. In other words, when students take ethnic studies, they can find themselves central to the educational enterprise, not simply observers of that. And this is particularly true for students who have been marginalized, both in the curriculum or in society itself. And that sense of centrality carries over into all of their work. So this is why I think ethnic studies is such an important uh, concept for education. Now, what can ethnic studies be? And what should good ethnic studies be? Uh, actually, I, I wrote a, a thing on eight principles of ethnic studies that uh, for the California State Board of Education last year. And I'm just gonna give just three of them here. Uh, number one, uh, I think good ethnic studies should every, give every student a sense of self, where they came from, where their group's stories are, uh, historically and in the contemporary world. The second thing, and this connects with what Gloria was saying, is ethnic studies should help students better understand others of other ethnic groups other than their own, and to understand how those ex other experiences are similar and different than those of their own group. And finally, uh, to go along with Gloria's third point, ethnic studies should help students gain a more critical understanding of societal forces, uh, cultural forces, institutional forces that have actually helped to shape the trajectories of different ethnic individuals and ethnic groups. Uh, so it is that centrality of those experiences that makes up good ethnic studies. Now, who should be included in ethnic studies? Uh, certainly uh, the core of ethnic studies is those groups who have been historically marginalized, historically marginalized in society, historically marginalized in a curriculum and textbooks. And that should be the core. But good ethnic studies should also stretch out to include all people uh, so that every student has the sense that they are a participant in the long trajectory of America. That's why I think one of the cores of ethnic studies should be the opportunity for students to engage in family history. Uh, it allows students to to do that. When I taught uh, Chicano history, even for students who are not Chicanos, what I did was say, write your own family history and then compare it to the experience of Chicanos that you've been studying uh, in the class. And this it makes an inclusive ethnic study. And so good ethnic study should then enlighten. It should enlighten history. It should enlighten how history has affected the present, 
It should enlighten how the equity challenges we still face and it should enlighten pathways to a more just, equitable and inclusive future. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Carlos. When I'm listening to both of you, um, it actually um, resonates around social and emotional learning and how that sense of belonging and how um, all of that ties into um, the basic needs of students to, that have to be in place before they can even get to um, academic, which is part of um, the content of both culturally relevant and ethnic studies. So thank you for that. I um, would like to turn now to Eric and, and hear a little bit about what this looks like on the ground. Um, we know that the Cleveland public school system has taken a number of steps to support more diverse and inclusive schools. So will you please tell us a little bit about these efforts and how they can be supported at the state and federal level? Certainly. So um, I'll start actually by building on the social emotional learning that you lift up, lifted up because Cleveland has been focused on explicit social emotional learning culture for over a decade. And as Dr. Ladson Billing said, that's not because we serve black and brown children, but because it's good for every child. So we work really aggressively to make sure our students understand their self-regulation and self-management, uh, their understanding of others and their emotions and how we engage in that relationship and then how we use those tools um, as problem solvers in the presence of academic content, as, as we heard, um, which has really built a muscle over time um, to be able to have the critical, difficult conversations that lots of us talk about, but very few of us actually do around issues like race and race equity. Um, and, and that's a body of work from pre-K through 12th grade for students and adults. Um, I also just want to uh, lift up um, Janelle George's work on magnet schools. We do not call ourselves a magnet system, but that is exactly the model we've implemented for now nine years, uh, where every student picks their own school based on themes or a curricula. Uh, they are inclusive in all the ways that was described in the literature. And we work aggressively, particularly for high school, that every eighth grade family needs to make an active choice. We will not assign a student to ninth grade, um, even if it's the day before school so that families do engage in a choice-making process that gives them power and gives them the opportunity. And it has drawn diverse populations from our suburbs back into the city to take advantage of our programming, including our School of the Arts, Schools of Science, Inter Baccalaureate and others. Uh, a third area is we've really leaned hard into how do we recruit a really top quality diverse staff and so we've created a partnership with Cleveland State University that we've expanded now to two others where student teachers who used to get assigned to Cleveland and felt damned into, this, into the urban center uh, didn't get the choice they want. Now actually uh, Cleveland State students compete for a fellowship where they work hard to become our teachers. We get a year to work with them. It has diversified those candidates and we get first pick at hiring them. Uh, we've also expanded our efforts on recruiting. So if you look at our Teach Cleveland recruiting, uh, we are very explicit about what it's like to be a black person in Cleveland, a Hispanic person in Cleveland, a gay person in Cleveland, so that people know that when you come here, you're not coming to work, you're coming to live and be part of a community. We've extended that into a five-year support program. And I'm really proud to say that every single person of color we hired last school year returned this school year. It's only one year, but that's a big marker in urban education. And then one last thing in staffing is we do have affinity groups. Um, MOCA is an example, our men of color shaping uh, achievement where we come together regularly, all leaders of color, whether you're a security leader, whether you're a teacher leader, a, a custodial leader to talk about the important role in this case of the black male in our schools. And then finally, I would say we've also been very explicit at building support systems that create the capital and social capital from an equity perspective that middle and upper middle income families already enjoy. So we have a 25 year tuition scholarship in place. Every graduate for the next 25 years will be go, able to go to trade school two year or four year college for free. Um, and we provide a mentor so that somebody who's studying what you're studying is talking to you and creates that social capital that says, hey, I know Maria, I'll get your resume to her, like what happens in the suburbs. And then K through 12, put health, mental health, legal, out of school options and other basic needs supports in place. Again, so that families have both the capital they need, I need food, 
and also the social capital, I know someone who can help me as a measure of equity uh, and also to attract diversity back into Cleveland Central uh, because like district boundaries, we are the ninth most segregated major city in the country. Uh, and we have to do things within and outside to bring people back. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Eric, for sh sharing. Um, I'm impressed at the, um, the scope of the work that you're doing. You haven't chosen one little piece, but you all have are thinking about multiple ways to get at and to um, structure supports and systems. So um, really appreciate the work that you're doing and um, you being here and sharing. Um, about that. I, I appreciate especially the flipping of the script around um, having student teachers and candidates um, competing for placements there because so often we do have this sense that, oh, um, a deficit view of um, our, our centers, our urban centers. So um, I love that you're um, flipping that switch, um, script and um, making that move. So um, thank you for sharing. And hopefully um, you'll share a little bit more as we um, continue the conversation. Um, it makes me actually think, um, Carlos, about uh, the work that you've been doing with um, bilingual education um, and thinking about uh, ways to create more inclusive and culturally diverse um, learning environments for um, those um, students in particular, our um, multilingual learners and our um, bilingual um, students. Can you share a little bit about um, bilingual education and the work you've done in that yeah. area? Well, yeah, thanks, Maria. This, is, this has been a huge jump because when we started back in the early 1970s with bilingual education, uh, it was mainly of two kinds. It was transitional, which means you get the kids through it as fast as you can so they're into English only, or <clears throat> into uh, make it maintenance, which is get kids in and let them continue to use that language. But we've evolved to now we have, uh, we have dual immersion programs where you have uh, students who are English speaking background going to in the same classroom with students who come from another language background. And the students, these, sometimes these go from kindergarten through third grade, sometimes kindergarten through high school where you can, where both can be learning those languages. And sometimes uh, these programs are very technical in which the goal is language learning, which is good. But to go along with the uh, point that uh, Eric and Gloria have mentioned, uh, many of them are very robust in the cultural and social aspects too. So you're getting this bridge building among cultures and, uh, and social groups uh, in ways that you, you can't get any other way. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the, uh, as you probably know, uh, I was the creative and cultural advisor for Dora the Explorer and Go Diego Go. And one of my favorite shows was the one we called uh, First Day of School in which we had boots uh, and Tico both going to a dual immersion school and the trajectory they had, both were nervous because they were gonna go to a school where monolingual Boots was gonna have to learn to speak and to work in Spanish and monolingual Tico had to learn to work in English, but they got there and there and they suddenly the bridges were built among kids of backgrounds. So some fairly magical things can be done through well-constructed bilingual education. Thank you, Cher. I'm wondering if um, Eric or Gloria um, their work intersects with that. And that's one of my favorite shows. <laughs> so I, I would just uh, really want to magnify what Dr. Cortez said that, you know, good equity work is both the, the science of equity and the agenda of equity. And early English learner work tended to be very technical, very science, but didn't have sitting behind it a philosophy or agenda. Uh, we have a large and increasingly diverse newcomer community here in Cleveland. And we intentionally named our Welcome Center the Multicultural Multilingual Department with Culture First. And our message is that we want to help you learn the English language and American culture while protecting, protecting and honoring your home language and home culture. And you need to be able to say why you're doing what you're doing so that the technical stuff you build, the what you build does what you're trying to do from an uh, equity point of view. So I really resonated with the transitions we've seen in the ELL world over time. And I would just say that the intersection for me has to do again with the pedagogical. I'm very uh, much reminded of an art, a very old article that Larry Cuban wrote many, many years ago entitled Ethnic Content, White Instruction. And in that article, I think it was probably written in the 70s that he argued, if we do the same thing with ethnic studies content that we've been doing with whatever content we have, we're going to get the same results. That we do have to do some other things pedagogically 
in the classroom to engage students. Um, students are not going to be any more excited about learning a list of names and dates and places about Black or Latinx people than they were about learning all about whites. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I think about the work of culturally sustaining pedagogy and thinking about, you know, I think that technical, um, the way that it was done technically also had an assimilationist tone to it as well, become as American as possible. And I think now there is definitely the um, focus on culture. Love the title of your newcomers um, center, Eric. Um, very thoughtful and very needed um, um, to be inclusive of uh, the nation's diversity. So um, if you would just um, say a little bit more, uh, Gloria, about your work in teacher preparation um, and how you think that um, what you think the role of teacher preparation is in laying the groundwork for in practice um, uh, strategies that we've heard from all of you today. Well, thank you. And, and this work actually takes me back to Eric's comments about retain, recruiting and retaining uh, the staff. I know we keep hearing a lot about, oh, we need more Black teachers. We need more Latinx teachers. But we say that again as if we need Black teachers for Black students, or we need Latinx students for Latinx. We need these teachers, period. We really need white students to have an experience in a classroom with a teacher from a different background or group, different from their own, so that they can begin to shift some of their thinking about hierarchy and, and who's capable, who is, you know, who has authority, who has knowledge. So I think that's an important component of who we are recruiting in teacher preparation. But I also think uh, the financial burden that rests on a number of our Black, Black and Latinx candidates is too great for them to choose teaching. You know, if I could choose to go get an MBA and make three times more money, I mean, it's just logical that I would do that. So one of the things we're doing here at Wisconsin is we've just launched what's called the teacher pledge, where uh, if you will agree to teach, stay in the state, uh, because we prepare lots of folks, but they go elsewhere. If you will agree to stay in the state, we will uh, pay down all of your, we'll pay your tuition at the in-state rate. We will also pay, if you have financial hardships, we will do that uh, like for housing, books, those kinds of things. What's interesting about this pledge, and we have $18 million to launch this. These are all donor dollars. And I think what's problematic about that is that the state has not stepped up. We are the University of Wisconsin, not the University of Big Donors. We are the University of, you know, when I first came here, I used to say we were state assisted because I looked at the, the proportion of money the state contributed, which wasn't very great. Well, over the 30 years I've been here, that proportion has continued to go down to the point where I describe us as state located. Oh. That's the part I can attest to. We are in this state but I can't tell you what it is that my state legislature is, is apportioning to us. And so we're struggling to get people to understand the importance of increasing our teacher uh, uh, workforce and making sure that it is a diverse workforce that is willing to stay here in this state. And that financial support is so key and so um grateful that you're going after the donors if you're not finding in the state because we know that um, Black and Latinx um, candidates enter through alternative pathways at higher rates and that causes um, larger turnovers. So if we're really thinking about um, a sustainable teacher workforce, we want one that has a high quality teacher preparation experience, which means right. a, a year long residency or a clinical placement um, with a um, high quality mentor teacher. So. Right. Um, that's so important. Um, so glad to hear that work's being done at Wisconsin. Um, switching back now to K-12, um, Eric, what's the role of a superintendent and other leaders in creating more inclusive learning experiences within the school? Well, you know, I think it's really critical that the, the school, top school leader uh, is very clear and, and very uh, explicit about the equity agenda for their community. And so, you know, an example in Cleveland, we have adopted what we call a declaration. We didn't adopt a policy. We adopted a declaration of who we're going to be 
um, as an organization that cares about diversity, equity, inclusion. We picked a research-based model called the Multicultural Organizational Model uh, by Dr. Evangela Hovino um, because we want science driving this. And if we are four years into uh, surveying employees against that model and scoring ourselves on how inclusive our organization is, um, I've written into state law um, that my high school students have a 400 student advisory committee. By law, they're the only ones in the nation that we know of, have the right and the responsibility to inform key decisions of this district. And we bring meaningful things to our kids. I mentioned that scholarship program. We brought all of the scholarship materials to my student advisory. We did a design challenge and they gave us back product that made sense to kids and families instead of the product that educators created and thought made sense. We hire a polling firm and sit behind the glass in focus groups and listen to not just our friends talk about us, but random people feedback on what the district's doing and, and not doing um, and, and you know, thinking about that. Um, I think there's a really nice opportunity here that I'm afraid we're gonna miss though in state and federal policy. This pandemic gives us an opportunity to rethink policies that have been, been in place since Laura Ingalls was roaming around farms like in Ohio um, and start creating systems that are designed for the communities we're serving. Uh, I'm a big fan of accountability, good accountability. We have not figured this out. When the accountability system can be predicted by color of skin, uh, poverty and zip code, it's not working. So how do we think about coming out of this with a new accountability of growing kids and closing gaps, as opposed to just racking and stacking what we already know, that my kids from a poor community, 86% of color, are going to score worse than the middle class suburban community right next door. So I hope we take advantage as leaders, not only internally, but as leaders pushing policy, um, in my case in Ohio, and, and also at the nation, and I've got great leadership and Congresswoman Fudge helping us do that. I am so glad to hear you say this, Eric. I have been zooming around the nation talking about the opportunity that this pandemic is, pre is presenting us. I've been quoting out of uh, Arundhati Roy's notion of the pandemic as a portal and that indeed we can drag all that crazy stuff that we had through the portal or we can leave it and we can start again. And I've been using the uh, metaphor of the hard reset. We all have these devices and we know what happens when they don't work the way we want them. And when you have to hear that person in the, uh, the, the, the device store say, you need a hard reset, we don't ever want to hear it. But if you haven't backed up stuff, you're going to get back a device that has taken everything off, all your contacts, all your pictures. It's going to be like it was from the factory. It's time for us to engage in a hard reset in schools. And I point out to people that it's not the first time that someone's had to do it. After World War II, Japan had to do it. Italy had to do it. They rethought the whole thing. And so when I hear people say, let's go back to normal, I, I go, no, 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 no. Because normal was a bad place for far too many of our kids. So let's, let's, let's go ahead to something much more exciting so thank, I'm glad you just you, you know I was copying off your paper because my state of the school <laughs> speech I said the earth is angry and she's hit the button and is it a pause or a reset that was exactly my words we cannot go back to normal and I, I quote Audrey Lord a lot um, that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house we have a chance to have new tools and do something different I'm with you you know it's funny. you're talking about the reset and leadership uh, the state of California the, the ethnic studies requirement for graduates from high school was vetoed by the governor, but it's coming back. Uh, <clears throat> at my local school district, Riverside, took the leadership to approve ethnic studies as a graduation requirement a month ago. And just Tuesday of this week, the city of Riverside adopted uh, an anti-racism vision, uh, which I wrote a, a two-page vision for, the, and, and that it includes working with the schools. So leader, and it was brought forth by the mayor. So you cannot underestimate the importance of leadership. And there's, there's certainly courage at the local level. It's going to co require conviction of state policy leaders and federal policy leaders. And right now my fear is that people either don't have the courage to push on these uh, current policies and replace them. So they're keeping their head down or they don't have the will that they don't feel it's important for kids like mine here in Cleveland. 
it makes me think that um, now is the moment that people can choose to be on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. So let's hope that more will be on the right side of history. Um, we have an interesting question from the um, one of our participants, um, Joan Brinker, Brinkerhoff, I hope I pronounced that right, um, asked about what about the empathy gap cross racially? We've talked about you know, achievement gaps and more importantly, opportunity gaps, which lead to achievement gaps. But what about the empathy gap um, across race, um, cross racially? Can I jump in on that, Maria? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to tie that in with something uh, that, that, that concerns me as English language learners. I think the cross empathy gap is a critical thing. Uh, and I, I got a daughter who's, uh, who's the director of ed educational services to English language learners in a large school district and <clears throat> works with, uh, has, has supervises a hundred elementary schools. And one of the things we found is that, uh, that empathy with English language learners is an important step for teaching because uh, as they, they like to talk, English language learner education, they like to talk about the dual backpacks that these kids bring that, uh, Kids who come uh, raised in English speaking homes don't have. Now, one of them is that they uh, that uh, they are learning a new language, but they're also learning subject matter in the language that they're just learning. And now COVID has come along and that's added a third backpack, which is they're learning from, often from home without the exposure to language in the schools. And even when they get computers, they get instructions to use the computers written in technical English, which is a language they're just learning and which their even their parents may not be able to read. So lack of empathy of reaching across affects, you know, it can be devastating. I, I would just also argue that, again, this is one of those opportunities that the pandemic presents. Uh, I'm talking to principals and superintendents all the time. And I'm telling them your first order of business is not getting back to preparing people for state assessments. Your first order of business is checking on the social and emotional needs of both your students and your staff, because we've all been traumatized as a part of this. Now, some people have written it out. Like I said, you know, a lot of times you hear people say, we're all, go we're all going through this. Well, we're going through the same storm but we're not all in the same boat. Some people are on a luxury liner doing this thing and some people are just holding on to a raft, but we are still experiencing the storm, all of us. And so I think once we, we sort of drill down to the social, emotional and mental health needs that this particular uh, situation has placed us in, that we have an opportunity to begin to draw uh, on this whole issue of empathy uh, in a very different way. I don't think George Floyd happens absent the pandemic. The mm. pandemic forces us because we can't go to the baseball game. We can't go to a basketball game. We can't go to a dance. We, can't, we have to sit there and see this man murdered in our living rooms. And it sparked something in this nation. Now, does it mean everybody was moved? No, but certainly enough people that we can have the right kind of conversation around empathy. And I know we're short of time, but I would just say we two quick points. One is we have to differentiate empathy gap from sympathy gap. Um, and that is by calling questions. So one big one in my community, the worst connected community in the country was, well, Eric, why aren't you parking school buses out in parking lots with hotspots on them so that kids can come and lean against the bus and have internet? And my answer was because none of us on this webinar are leaning against the bus to have internet. That's a sympathy gap, solve the problem for the poor child, for the black child, as opposed to empathy of what are we going to do? I think the other issue is that, and we mentioned it earlier, we have to broaden this conversation outside of the diverse community that I'm in and into the white suburban communities that I've worked in in my past so that the empathy is not that we all like each other, but the rest of the world doesn't like us, um, but that we all start to understand the beauty of the diversity of our country. Mm -hmm. That's and and so one thing, the empathy requires the courage to deal with otherness in an honest manner. And if you're not willing to do that, all you can be is sympathetic. You can't be empathetic. Mm -hmm. And you have to engage. You can't have empathy from across there. You have to have relationship and engagement. 
Oh, it pains me, <laughs> the fact that we're at time. Um, thank you so much um, for your conversation today, your insights, your examples. Um, we so appreciate that. And hopefully in the future, we'll have another opportunity to gather together. Um, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, so on behalf of LPI and the National Coalition on School Diversity, we'd like to thank all of our speakers for not only participating in this event, but for the important work they do each and every day and taking time from that work to be with us today. Our partners and presenters also have some wonderful resources available on their websites as shown on this slide and on the link shared in the chat box. A recording of this web webinar as well as all of the resources we've shared today will be sent to you via email. And finally, I'd like to mention that a survey will appear in your window when you leave this webinar and we'd appreciate your feedback. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you all have a wonderful day.